Welcome everyone. We start with Gideon. Gideon, you're from the Maastricht University. You're an expert in the field of gravitational waves yes. and their detection. You're also going to explain what it means uh, and, uh, to see a gravitational wave, but they tell us about the origin of the universe. So that's also a very interesting topic. Then we have Michiel. Michiel is at the <coughs> University of Twente, and he is specialized in low temperatures. And Michiel helps to cool down the mirrors of this magnificent telescope to minus 260 degrees below zero. And that's necessary to keep vibrations as low as possible. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Peter, and everybody, thank you for being here tonight to let me speak about this very, very fascinating topic. Uh, you can imagine I'm heavily biased about how interesting this is, but I hope I can convince you that it really is interesting and that we can learn all kinds of beautiful stuff about the universe using this machine that we're going to call the Einstein uh, telescope. Now, we will get there when we get there, because first, well, we have to talk about uh, physics because that's what the machine does. It, you, it needs physics, this is what Michiel is going to talk about, to do the measurement, but you also need physics to understand what exactly it is that it measures. So let's start with a brief introduction of the type of stuff that we are investigating as physicists. And the answer, there we go. Probably have to stand over here to make sure that the machine catches my, uh, my laser. Uh, well, as physicists, what we are doing is that we are investigating the universe. So, I have a picture here of the universe. Um, yeah, you have to learn how to read the picture. So, let's walk through it for a little bit. Literally walk, because I'm going to stand over here, which is for you on the left-hand side of the picture. This is a timeline. This is the origin of the universe, the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. And when I walk from here to here, I'm walking forward in time all the way to the right-hand side of the picture, which is now. You can actually see the James Webb telescope over there. So that's what the horizontal direction means in my picture over here. The vertical direction is a measure of how big the universe is. And if you walk from all the way at the Big Bang, at the left-hand side to the right-hand side, you can see that this shape is shaping bigger and bigger and bigger. This is what we mean by the expansion of the universe. And this is what we, as physicists, study. We would like to know how did the universe come to be, what happened in those 13.8 billion years. Um, well, there's an enormous amount of information in there, and we only have 45 minutes. So, well, time is relative, but let's not shape it up too much. Okay, let's keep it a little bit short. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that I'm going to skip here, but I'm going to mention a few um, important topics. First of all, the 13.8 billion years that the universe has, e has existed. Um, has it been expanding? That's what I was talking about when the universe, right, that shape on the vertical axis was shaping up and becoming bigger. Uh, it, it's, it goes faster and faster, the expansion of the universe, for reasons that are unknown. There's a Nobel Prize for whoever finds out why that exactly is. Um, but the most important thing that I want to point out is this thing over here. You can see my red cursor. This point, so that's fairly in the early part of the universe, about 400,000 years after Big Bang. This well, bluish-green slab that you see over here, that's actually the moment that the universe, for the first time in its existence, gave off light. This is when light started to shine. Now, this might sound a little strange because you might think, wait a minute, wasn't there a Big Bang? And a Big Bang is an explosion, an explosion comes with sound and it comes with light. In fact, my picture actually has light over here at the Big Bang. That's just for dramatic effect. Okay, <laughs> the, the universe's explosion, the Big Bang itself, was not an explosion in that sense of the word. It was not like a hand grenade. It had something to do with the start of the expansion of the universe. And here's the thing. Light was trapped in matter at that moment. And it took a while for that light to detach itself from the matter and started shining. So there was light, but it was trapped in matter. It's very much like you have water that is trapped into the clouds. And at some point, if it gets cold enough, so to say, the clouds will let go of that water and then it starts raining. That's very much the same thing over here. As the universe became bigger, bigger, bigger from the Big Bang to that moment, at some point, the matter let go of the light and this is when the light started shining. And that's this slab that you see over here. Now, why do I mention this so explicitly? Because I thought we were going to talk about gravitational waves and then here I am talking about light. 
Well, that is because everything that you see in this picture, we as humankind have figured out in the last hundreds of years by looking at the universe using light, right? It's telescopes, light telescopes. Optical light, infrared, ultraviolet, etc. But it's all light. But that also means that you cannot look beyond this slab, because before that time there was no light, it was still trapped. So that means no matter how big you make your light telescope, there is stuff over there that literally cannot be seen. It's not a matter of making your telescope better and better. What was not sent out cannot be seen by a telescope. So with our light telescopes, we cannot look into the Big Bang itself, and we would really like to know as physicists what happened over there. Okay, so we need something else except for light. Now, you can already tell that I'm talking my way towards gravitational waves. Uh, there's a little bit more to it, too. Um, in this stuff over here, that the stuff that we can see with light, stars, galaxies, etc., um, there's an enormous amount of stuff that we know exists and does not send out light itself. Right? It's this famous dark energy and dark matter. We know by the way that they push and pull on stuff that there is gravity there, but gravity requires stuff but that stuff cannot be seen by light. And you can calculate that this is about 95% of the universe. So not only with light can we not look into the Big Bang, we can only see 5% of what's here. So it would really be important if we had something that allows you to look at stuff without using light. These are these gravitational waves that we're going to talk about in a moment. Now, there we go. Let's take an example. This is, well, four or five billion years ago. This is when something very beautiful happened. And I'm going to show you a picture of that. There you go. It's an animation. But here you see two stars, black holes, orbiting each other. Uh, look at this. Whoop. They absorbed each other into one big black hole. And what came out of that is this greenish wrinkle that is now spreading through the universe. This happened about five billion years ago. Now, these wrinkles go with the speed of light, that's very fast, but the universe is very big, so it takes a while, five billion years, and at some point, these wrinkles will, well, they will hit the Earth. And now look at what the Earth is doing as they get swashed over by these wrinkles. It starts to wobble. I have to say, this is a highly exaggerated effect, okay, in this <laughs> video. It's, it's really not that bad, and, 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 and Peter already said these, these, these are these gravitational waves, and they're really, really small. And I'm going to name a few numbers in a moment. It depends on the source and how far away, but it's way, 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 way smaller than even an atom. So the effect is true. It's just not as big as you can see in the video. Again, dramatic effect. So um, these were measured. These were calculated by Einstein already in 1915 or 1916 that these should exist, these gravitational waves. And 100 years later, 2015, they were measured by this huge telescope called the, uh, the, the LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatory in the United States. And then these people, these three gentlemen, got the Nobel Prize immediately after. And that was no surprise to no one. Okay? When these were measured, everybody knew in the physics community this is a Nobel Prize. Because now, all of a sudden, this prediction by Einstein that these ripples would exist in space-time was demonstrated to be true, and that means the door is now open to measure the missing 95% of the universe and the start of the universe itself. Now, th that is worthy of a Nobel Prize. I do have to say that the Nobel Prize, unfortunately, only goes to three people in, in one go. And this LIGO that I spoke about has thousands of scientists in there, but there you go, you can only give it to three people, and these people uh, got it. There you go. So uh, this was in 2015. It was made uh, world news in 2016. You might have picked it up in the newspapers back then. Um, we're now nine-ish years uh, later, and we have now about 90 of these gravitational waves being measured. And you see a little catalog over here. By the way, uh, here and in the rest of my presentation, I'll have a couple of links in case you want to look up some more technical details. And of course, you can email me later if you want to know more of the technical stuff. But here you see a picture of all the black holes that have been measured since, and well, the current observation run of the gravitational wave detectors has started about a year ago. So we're measuring more and more with a rate of about one per week. Uh, that's progress, by the way, because Einstein predicted them in 1916. The first one was measured in 2015, so it means one gravitational wave per century, and now it's about one per week. So that means people are making progress, so that's good. Um, but what are these gravitational waves? I showed you an animation. Let's see if we can do a little bit better than that. 
In order to do so, I have to explain to you general relativity, Einstein's theories. And I have about one slide to do with it. So, <laughs> so with my students, it typically takes about four or five months before, but that's, that's because we do the math, okay? The idea, in retrospect, is really not that difficult. It, it takes a moment to adapt the mind to it, but the idea is not that hard. Here it is. Gravity is the curvature of space. And also time, but for my story, I just need the spacey part. It's the gravity, it's the curvature of space. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you might have seen this picture before, that if space, and by space I literally mean distance between any two points, that the distance between two points is elastic. You can make it bigger, you can make it smaller. Now, obviously, I can make the distance between myself and Michiel bigger and smaller, I just have to walk towards him, yes? But that's me walking through space. And I can make the distance between us larger by walking away. But here's what Einstein discovered 100 years ago. It's that the distance between us, the amount of meters itself can stretch and can shrink. I don't do the moving, he doesn't do the moving, the space between us does. Space is elastic. That's what we mean by the curvature of space. Time is also elastic. But again, for my story, I'm just going to go with the spacey part. Well, here's a famous example. You have the sun here. The spacey part is here depicted in green. It's stretchable, so if you put something on it, you get a dent. And if you have a dent in something, then it's very difficult to walk into a straight line. Yes? If there's a dent here in the floor and I try to walk in a straight line, as one does, for Newton's first law, then the dent, dent is going to give me a little curve. And then you can tell by my motion that apparently there must have been a dent over here. This is the underlying mechanism of general relativity. You see something move through space, it goes into a curve, and then you can say that means that the space through which the thing was moving apparently had a dent in it. Now, you might think, well, that sounds a little crazy. There we go. Because how did Einstein get to that idea in the first place? Well, because Einstein was a very smart man, he took something that well, actually, everybody already knew for hundreds, literally hundreds of years, something that is called, well, in very expensive words, the equivalence principle. Let me show you what that, what that means. Um, here's an experiment. In a moment, what you will see is that in a big vacuum chamber, no air friction, they're going to drop a bowling ball and a feather. Now, if you lift up a bowling ball in one hand and a feather in the other, you can really tell that the bowling ball wants to go down. <laughs> yes? A little bit more than the feather does. So you would expect that if you then drop them, that they, the bowling ball would go really rapidly down and the feather would just <whistles> go down by not so much. Here's the interesting thing. If you actually do the experiment, you will see that they drop with exactly the same rate. There you go. It's in slow motion, so you can really tell. So a 10, 20, 30 kilo ball in something that weighs maybe 100 grams, there you go, drop down at exactly the same rate. It's because they left out the air friction, right? If there's air friction, then the air bounces uh, against the, the underside and then the effect is gone. But if you just let gravity do its work, they go down with exactly the same rate. Now, this is what is called the equivalence principle. Now, you might say, well, I, I sort of knew this already. Because when I was back in high school, my teacher in physics taught me that everything drops down with 9.81 meter per second squared, right? It's this famous number. How fast things drop down, with what acceleration. But your teacher might have never told you why every object does that with the same number. And the answer is he, he didn't know why or she. No, no, nobody does. Up until this point, nobody does. But we do know that it's true. It's completely measurable. Now, this has a deep consequence. So this was known already for 400 years. Everything, no matter what the object is, will always drop down with exactly the same rate if only gravity works on it. Now, what did Einstein do with that little piece of knowledge? There you go. He made a very big conclusion. This was about uh, 1908. He was a young man. The picture doesn't show it. But back, back then, he was only uh, in, its, uh, in his late 20s. Um, he came to a conclusion. He said, wait a minute. If everything drops down in exactly the same way, then maybe the dropping of things, gravity, has nothing to do with the object, right? If objects would, or gravity would be different per object, then things would have dropped different per object. So gravity is not an, a characteristic of an object, it must be a characteristic of something else. 
and he attached the dropping to the thing through which the dropping is happening, space itself. Now, this is a strange idea, but we can make it a little bit more explicit. Let's take the globe. And suppose that I am on the equator of the globe, somewhere in the Sahara. And I decide that I'm going to walk north. And let's pretend that there's a walking path and I don't have to worry about the Mediterranean. Okay, just walk upwards. Now, I walk upwards, and at some point I will find myself at the North Pole. All right, I've done the experiment. Now, let's take anyone else. Let's take my cat. Put her on the equator. Let her walk up north. My cat will also end up on the North Pole. Yes? Now, nobody is surprised about that because everybody says, yeah, but th that's obvious. Because it's the shape of the Earth that determines where you end up if you start walking. It's not the cat. It's not me. The shape of the Earth points you toward it. The only thing that Einstein now did was, if you have a curved space, then everything ends up at exactly the same place in exactly the same way. Einstein said, well, equivalence principle, I see everything moving in exactly the same way, so therefore there must be a curved thingy over there. Space itself. That was the big idea. Exactly because everything drops in exactly the same rate, that means you can assign the dropping to the curvature of space through which you walk, through which you move. And that means that Gravity, in that sense, is not a force. It's a curvature of space itself that you have to do. Allow me another analogy, just to drive this point home, because it's important for the rest of our story. Suppose that you would be... You have these little toy trains, yes? And I have a little toy train, I lay out my track, and I put a little curve, right? The train track goes to the left at some point, I let my train right, and at some point that train will go to the left. All right. I remove that train, put down a completely different train. Different amount of carts, different color, different mass. I let that train ride. It will still go to the left at exactly the same place. And you understand why. It's because where the train ends up is determined by the track and not by the object. Now suppose that you were not able to see the train track. You would only be able to see the trains. But you always see every single train, no matter what it is, go to the left at the same place. There you go. There must be a train track. It might be invisible to you, but it's there. That's the curvature of space. That's the analogy that Einstein took. Now, is this a fairy tale? No, it's completely measurable. Here's one example. I'm going to show you a few to drive the point home that is really true. Einstein himself immediately said, well, here's my curved space. Let's make a dent in it. It's stretchable. Let's make a train track in it. The sun does it in this case. Everything that tries to move through that space will get a curve. That's my little train that goes to the left. That means if you're on Earth here, and there's a star behind the Sun, without Einstein's prediction, light would have traveled in a straight line. Would have ended up here, would have missed your telescope on Earth. But because of Einstein's prediction of the curvature of space, that light takes a curve, like my little train track, and ends up in my detector. That means I can see the stars behind the Sun. He made a prediction. He calculated, if that were true, that that should be measurable. And he was in luck because a couple of years after this prediction, 1919, they did the measurement. This was Eddington. And there was a solar eclipse. That's fortunate because you cannot see the stars during, this, during the day. But because of the solar eclipse, you could see the stars, even the sun was shining. Right? Everything got dark. And that was in 1919. And then Eddington, an experimenter, he did the measurement and while the solar eclipse uh, happened, all of a sudden, all these stars behind the sun became visible. And exactly at the place where Einstein predicted that it was. Now, that was a big discovery. All of a sudden, the curvature thing was true, or at least in this experiment, it turned out to be. Here's a second one, also by Einstein. He said, wait a minute, if space, let's take Michiel again as an example, if the space between us is stretchable, he could calculate that the stretching should be indefinite. It should go on all the time. But that means that between, I'm sorry, I keep taking you as an example, but that means that the distance between him and me would be bigger. We see each other move away from each other. But, well, between the two of you, the same stretching would take place, and you two would be moving away from each other. And every single person, every space in between you would be stretching out. So he said, well, if my stretchy space idea is true, then if you look at the universe and at the stars and the galaxies, not only would you see them move away from us, 
they should also be moving away from each other because every direction has a stretchable space going on. And that too was measured. There you go. This was done by Hubble, 1929. This is when people knew the universe really does expand. And again, this was according to Einstein's calculations. Now, pretty good. All right, so you now know general relativity, yes? <laughs> All clear. Now, this is my one slide with a formula on it. They always say you never have to show a formula because you lose half of the audience, so I decided to have only one of them in, but here it is. Because the only thing that Einstein still had to do, he had to turn his idea of the stretchy space-time into a formula. Now, we're not going to do the formula. It looks pretty benign, by the way, because it, it's, it fits on one line. But that's because the symbols are chosen to fit on one line. If you write this out, it takes about two pages, okay? But this is the formula. Now, if you want to know why this formula is true, different story, etc. but the idea actually is very simple. It says, stretchiness of space, that's on the left of that equation. How big is the dent? Where are the curvature tracks? The right side of the equation is where you put the matter that makes the dent, the planet that you put there to make the dent in the space. That's this formula. It's called the Einstein field equation. Now, um, there's a number there. It's very small. 10 to the power minus 45, so zero, and then a dot, decimal point, 44 numbers, zeros, and then a one. That's a small number. That means that this side, this is almost zero, so this part better be very big to compensate for the very smallness, yes? So, in other words, you need an enormous amount of matter and energy to make a dent. So when I say space is stretchable, well, yes, that's true, but it's very stiff. You need an enormous amount of matter. Gravity is weak. It takes a whole bunch of matter to finally feel something. And this, too, you might know, because, look, I mean, this is a planet underneath us, yes? It has 10 to the power 24 kilograms. That's a big number. And all this gravity is trying to make a dent and trying to push me down. And look, there you go. It's not that hard. I could easily <laughs> adapt it, yes? That's the smallness of that number that you see over there. So this is the Einstein field equation, and when Einstein wrote this down, 1916, he said, this is such a complicated equation, nobody is ever, ever, ever going to find a solution to it, only by approximation, maybe. The formula is just too difficult. This was 1916, January. There you go, this is three months later, the first solution was found. <laughs> yes? This was by uh, Mr. Schwarzschild, uh, and I have to add, he did it while in uh, the First World War, he was a soldier. So he did this while, I don't know, uh, fighting for freedom, etc. But he found the first solution to the equation. It's now called the Schwarzschild solution. And the Schwarzschild solution we now know as the black hole. It tells us that there you can make a dent in space-time, you can curve the space-time, but to such an amount that it's very difficult to climb out of, of it again. Now here's why I am going to say something about the stretchiness of time. It's not just space that stretches, it's also time that stretches. Now, one way in order not to climb out of something is that it takes an infinite amount of time. Yes? That's not always saying that it will never happen. The Schwarzschild solution tells you that space and time stretch in such an amount, if you get very close to mass, that time stretches to zero. That means it takes an infinite amount for you to climb out of it. That's not a way of saying that you won't ever get out. But that means nothing can get out, including light itself. So the prediction by Schwarzschild is there should be objects in the universe that literally make time stand still and make nothing come out. These are these famous black holes. Einstein didn't believe that, by the way. He, he, mean, he, he knew there was a solution to his equation, but he said, yeah, 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 not that one, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> there we go. Um, they do exist. Um, in fact, the Nobel Prize a few years ago went to uh, these three people, one of them theoretical work and the other two, for measuring the existence of black holes. And there you go. How did they measure this? Well, they looked at the center of our galaxy. And that's the picture that you see on the right here. It's a video. It's moving. There we go. Because you might not be able to see the black hole, but you can certainly see the stuff trying to move around it. There's something in the middle there that you itself cannot see. But it's pushing and pulling on the stars around it. And if you do the calculation, there you go. It's exactly, again, according to what 
Einstein's theory predicted. Now, this is not just everything. You might have seen this picture a few years back in 2019, the first photo of a black hole made by the Event Horizon Telescope, including colleagues in Nijmegen University. So there you go. They really, really exist. All right, now, let's take two of them, two of these black holes. Let's make them orbit around each other. There you go. Now, in green, you see the curvature of space-time again. You see the black holes. They start moving around each other. Each of them makes a big dent. This is slow motion effect, again, for drama. Give it a second. Even more drama. And now they melt into each other. And you get this extremely big dent in the middle now. Two black holes absorb each other. Their curvatures, their holes sort of merged. And now you had this amount of stuff that was flying out. That was the gravitation wave with which he started today. If space is stretchable, that means you can stretch it, you can push it, you can dent it, and if you hit it with just the right force, you get something that wrinkles out. That's the gravitational wave. Now, while you were looking at the video, you might have seen this little animation on the back. This is if you do the actual calculation. It should look something like this. Space stretches, 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 it wobbles, it oscillates, then the black holes merge, you get this huge explosion that comes out. That's this part in the middle. We call that the merger, and then you have this final black hole and it sort of wobbles a little bit, and then it sort of dies out and it becomes silent again. So if gravitational waves do exist according to Einstein and Schwarzschild, then the prediction is that it should look like this. Now let's do the measurement. There you go. I'll just stand over here a little closer to the, uh, to the laptop. There you go. <coughs> Left-hand side is prediction. The right-hand side was the measurement. This was the Nobel Prize. Right? You can see that it was exactly as predicted. Now, these were measured by the LIGO detector. I already mentioned this. And again, going back to the current day, about 90 of these things we have now discovered. So, you have a background now in gravitational waves. Now, what can you do with that stuff? Well, I already mentioned that you can measure stuff in the universe that does not send out light. The black holes themselves, but many other things as well. Uh, there's too many of them to go into full detail, but feel free to ask me questions later. Um, here's an interesting one. Remember that I was saying that the universe was expanding? You can measure this by looking at the stars moving away from each other. You can now also look at the expansion by looking at the gravitational waves. You can predict and even better measure how much the universe is expanding. But if you know how it's expanding, you can go back in time and calculate how it started. That's new information. That's this what you have over here. Um, there's all kinds of things about black holes themselves that you can measure. But a very important one I think that we should talk about for a little is this one. Keep fighting with the thing, but that's okay. We'll make it like this. Let's look at a video again. These are not black holes. These are what are called neutron stars. They're heavy enough to make gravitational waves, but not so heavy that they keep their own light. They send out light and gravitational waves. And if they bump into each other, you get these gravitational waves coming out, plus a flash of light. Now, in August of 2017, the gravitation wave detectors that were measuring happily measured a burst of gravitation waves and said, wait a minute, by your calculations, these are not black holes. should be something else. So they called up their friends in the optical telescopes and said, you should look over there right now. If we're right, you should get a big flash of light coming exactly from that point where we measured the gravitational wave. And they did that. And all of a sudden, puff, big flash of light seen over there. Now, if you know your physics, then you know that if you look at the color of light, you can tell what kind of material is built into it, yes? Every gas has their own light color. So by looking at that light and tracking it for two days, three days, four days, at that point where they saw the big flash of light and the gravitational waves, they could tell which type of atom was there, and they actually in real time saw new atoms being created. And if you put this into your uh, periodic system, there you go. All right, these are the chemical elements that we know of. All the yellow ones were measured in that collision of two neutron stars. That's a solved mystery. For the longest time, people in chemistry and physics, astrophysics, did not know where all these higher metals came from. 
We can make them in the lab right now, but where does the universe get them from? It also includes gold. It includes silver. You might notice I have a little piercing here on my eyebrow. The material in that piercing literally is made in the collision of two neutron stars. That's a solved mystery. Well, nobody cared about my piercing, but the, 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 where, where the material came from, okay? <laughs> so, so what do gravitation waves offer us? Well, a whole bunch of stuff. First of all, we can look at the universe using something that is not light. That's a good thing. We can measure the expansion of the universe and its origin, so they're very big, but also very small, because we can do chemistry with it now. Um, we can calculate ahead, calculate in the back. We can predict now much better what the universe will do in the future and what it did in the past. And here's the important one. Remember, I, at the beginning I said you cannot look through this slab because this is when light started and before there was no light. The gravitation waves were there at the Big Bang itself. Gravitation waves allow us to literally make a photograph of the origin of the universe, the Big Bang itself. It's not there yet. It's going to take 10, 20 years or so. Yes, but it will be there. This is not me marketing this thing. It's, it's, this is really what's, what we're going to see. Humankind will have a photo of the origin of the universe in the next couple of decades or so. Now, how do we measure this? Well, it's very difficult <laughs> because the waves are very small. I mean, I already mentioned that they're much smaller than the size of an atom, and let's make it more explicit. It depends on the source and how far away because they get smaller as they travel. But the typical amount that you need, right, the stretching of space, is about a millionth the size of the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. That's about 10 to the power minus 21 meters. All right, so it's 0 dot 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, that's halfway, one meter, yes? They're really, really small. So you have to work really hard to measure them. Now, I've taken one of the current gravitation wave detectors, the Virgo detector in Italy. It's, it's literally a machine, a couple of tubes in the, in, the, in the meadow of Italy. In fact, if you know where to look, here's, where, here, here's Pisa. And these are three kilometer long tubes. And here's the idea. What they do is they send a laser beam through each of the two tubes. There's one laser beam that goes in this direction. Three kilometers along the way, it hits a mirror. And then the thing comes back, the laser light. Same thing here, three kilometers, pop, pop, and gets back. And over here, those two laser lights are made to overlap. Now, overlapping light has a nice property that it, it can enforce itself. If you do it just right, two laser lights on top of each other make extra light. And if you do it wrong, you get two laser lights that uh, cancel each other out. But that only works at the moment that the distance from here to here is exactly the right number. Three kilometers. All right. But of course, if a gravitational wave comes by, then, as you see over here, if a gravitational wave comes by, space stretches. And three kilometers is not three kilometers anymore. It's three kilometers plus a little extra. And that means all of a sudden the two laser lights on top of each other look different, give a different effect. This actually is the answer to Peter's question that he said he had his measuring rod. And he said, well, how can you measure this? Because the rod itself is also subject to the stretching of space. Well, it's because we have another one sticking out in the other direction. So you can co compare them to each other. This is why it's called relativity. You can only compare, you can only know, only know stuff if you compare stuff. So that's the idea. But because the effect is so small, you have to work really hard, and Michiel is going to talk more about this, on how to make this so uh, measurable, because you have all kinds of stuff that is going to thwart your measurement. Seismic, the ground is shaky. I'm, I'm not talking about earthquakes, it's literally just me walking here, means a couple of kilometers along the way, the ground will be doing a little bit of this. Very little amount, but too big for the machine. Uh, heat, particles are moving up and uh, around. That, too, is too big of an effect for us to do the measurement correctly. The laser itself is very accurate, but somewhat unstable. That's quantum mechanics for you. Quantum mechanics says that some things cannot be made infinitely stable. You have to work hard. There's other quantum effects that I'm going to leave out now, but it's a hard job to make this work. There you go. Here you can see the effect again. So, with that machine, the Virgo detector and the one in, in the United States, we can measure these things. And here's another plot 
what you see over here is how far, how massive the black holes should be in order for you to measure them. And this is how far in the universe you can look. And with our current detectors, the purple triangle is about what we see. Some black holes in this range and only this far. If we can make the seismics and the thermal and the quantum and the machinery better, 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 better still, then all of a sudden you're not just measuring this, the purple blot that we can now see, the one per week gravitational wave, you can see all the way up to the green, the Einstein telescope. So that means all these black holes here, all the way deep into the universe. Now, how deep in the universe? That's interesting. It's exactly the size of the visible universe. With the new machine in mind, this is the Einstein telescope, we will be able to literally see to the edge of the visible universe. That's what the machine was constructed for. It's not there, right? It's under construction, but here we are. So, the Einstein telescope, here it is. It's an underground machine. Why underground? Because then my stomping on the ground will not disturb too much. It will be at um, low temperature, because then you have little uh, effect of the heat disturbing your measurement. It will be 10 kilometers long, not three, like the current detectors, 10. The stretching of space is true for every meter. So if you have two meters, you have two times the stretching of space, and 100 meters is 100 times the stretching of space. So the more meters you have, the more accurate you can do the measurement. So we're going to make it 10 kilometers long, and it's completely filled with technologies to make the lasers and the vacuum systems and the mirrors as accurate as possible. Again, Michiel is going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment, about the technologies. But if you get this machine to work as we plan it, you're not going to measure one gravitation wave per week, as we are now doing, but about a million per year. There's a couple of hundreds per day, up to a thousand, something like that. It's an enormous amount of data. Now, remember those solved mysteries I was talking about, that we, we already solved with 90 of these things? It took us eight years to get to 90. This machine will have 90 of them every few hours. Now, that's big science, all the way to the edge of the universe. And we're going to get as many gravitation waves as our curve machines take about 10 years to measure every few hours. Now, that's a big thing. That brings us to my final few slides, namely, in order to make that Einstein telescope, that technology has to be developed. Now, we already know that it's there because we have working machines, but they have to be made better. We have to R&D, we have to do research and development on this, and this is one of the groups that does this, is my group, well, I'm not, the le I'm not the leader, I'm just one of the people, uh, in Maastricht University. And you can see here the, there you go, for people in the know, this is Randwijk, part of Maastricht, Kennedy Bridge, and here is the old printing press of the Limburg, the newspaper was the only place in Maastricht that was big enough of a hall that you can build the Einstein telescope in a small version. It's called the ET Pathfinder. It's not 10 kilometers long, that doesn't fit anywhere, okay? <laughs> it's about 10, 20, 30 meters long. In fact, I have a picture of that as well. There you go. Here's the ET Pathfinder as it currently is. These are the two laser beams that go along these things. Way too small to actually measure gravitational waves from the universe, but that's not what it's for. It's to make sure that these laser technologies and the vacuum technologies and the mirror technologies are developed better and better and better, so by the time the big machine, the Einstein telescope, will be built, everything works. Yes? Again, it's not something you can get off the shelf. You have to develop these things. And that's what the ET Pathfinder does. It's a research and development. So, what is it that we investigate? Well, a whole bunch of stuff. And again, I'm going to leave it to Michiel in a moment to talk a little bit more. But one of them is, again, the laser technology. You have to have very stable lasers. Now, the nice thing about fundamental science, that where you need very good machines, is that those machines can also be used in industry, in other fields. So, the Pathfinder, is actually funded, in large part, by non-scientific partners. Because industry says, you know what, if you're going to build a very good laser, uh, I'm going to use that laser as well. Same with control systems. Same with optics. To really know how optics works is very useful in all kinds of other technologies as well. Here's one that I'm interested in. If you're going to have about a million gravitation waves per year, it takes a few months for one gravitation wave to be filtered out of the data that you measure. Now, so that, that's only one. Now we have a million. So you have to have machines, computers, algorithms that really can do this stuff a lot faster. 
So that means there's an enormous driving force to either to get an algorithm that does it better or to get a machine like a quantum computer that, that does it for you. So we have collaborations with IBM to work on this, to develop this. Now, I hope you understand that, yes, we do it because we do the gravitation wave stuff, but the whole industry is waiting for machines, computers that can do calculations a million or a billion times faster than, than, than they can now. That is useful for all of society. So again, this is why the Pathfinder is supported by a whole bunch of other stuff than just people from universities. So here's a couple of them. A whole bunch of people, and there's much more, including the University of Twente, and I thank the organizers for having me to talk to you good people about this. This is what we're working on, together with colleagues in Belgium, France and in Germany, to get this machine off the ground, to really make it work. So here's a timeline. How long is this going to take us? Well, um, the Pathfinder is already there. I showed you a photo, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was there this morning, and I will be there again tomorrow. So that machine is already there. We're already doing the development. The big machine, the big Einstein telescope, has to be decided by the European uh, community, because it has to be built somewhere. Maybe it's Italy, maybe it's the Netherlands. We don't know yet. This is for politicians to decide, and we hope that the decision will be made in a few years now, 2025. But then the construction will start. We hope it will be here. <laughs> and then it will become operational 2035, and it's built to last for about 50 years. Now think about this. 50 years of a million gravitation waves per, per year, all the way to the edge of the universe, and all the way into the heart of the Big Bang itself. I'm not overselling. This is literally what the machine is built for. So we're going to do an enormous amount of science in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And I, I cannot wait to see what comes out of it. Now, I'm going to wrap up, but a um, little of a marketing pitch. If you think, you know what, I would like to know more about this stuff. It so happens that at the edge of Limburg in Kerkrade, myself and colleagues are currently building what is called the Einstein Telescope Education Center. It's a five-story museum on the technology, general relativity, black holes, all having to do with the Einstein telescope. It's under construction as we speak, and it will be delivered. This is already there, so there's something to see already. But it will be fully delivered in September of this year. So it's an open invitation. If you want to know more about this, either contact me or drop by in Kerkrade in about a year now or so. And with that, I'm going to wrap up. Um, I can imagine maybe there's more questions than we can fit uh, today, but you can easily contact me. And it so happens that we made a few videos on the Einstein telescope, three each, 20 minutes apart. So if you want to know more, please watch these videos. If you want to know more still, feel free to contact me. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Gideon, thank you so much for explaining so many complicated things in such a very accessible way. The way you explained Einstein's theory was really, really impressive to me. Thank and you. the Einstein telescope, of course. Um, in a few moments, we switch to Michiel. Perhaps you can install your uh, presentation. Um, and I give you the opportunity to ask questions, of course, to Gideon. I have one myself, Gideon, okay, if I yes. may kick off. Sure. Um, the, the, the space-time ripples are so tiny here on Earth because the objects are far, far away. That's the reason why. Yes. They, they, it spreads to the universe and gets the energy is distributed, so yes. to say. Yes, the, uh, there's two reasons, actually. So the, the gravitation waves themselves are very small, right? Yeah. Their amplitude, the stretching is very small. I yeah. mentioned these much smaller than an atom or even the nucleus of an atom. It's mm -hmm. for two reasons. One of them has mm -hmm. to do with that small number that I showed you in, in my one formula slide. It takes an enormous amount of energy to make a gravitation wave. So that means if you make one, it has to be small. Mm -hmm. It is really just the, the, the stiffiness of the, of the space-time itself. That's one. Mm -hmm. And the second reason is, as you mentioned, that gravitation waves have to spread out. And they spread mm -hmm. out in all directions. And there's only so much energy to spread out in all directions. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like light, right? Mm -hmm. That also goes down if you go away from it. But it's not that bad, because light goes down with 1 over square of a mm -hmm. distance, and gravitation waves go, go down 1 over distance itself. Okay. Uh -huh. So, again, two reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. And one question that's worrying me a little bit. Um, two black holes, they are yes. circling around each other. They are falling, they are merging in the end. Could theoretically merge the Sun and the, and the Earth? 
uh, so the, the Earth is circling oh, around the sun. Yeah. That's also radiating gravitational yes. waves, I think. Yes, no, that's correct, yes. And, and how uh, dangerous is this for our planet? Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> is there, yeah. we're uh, losing energy. Yes, no, that's true. I mean, uh, I mean uh, in my examples, I show these orbiting black holes, yes. um, but all masses, remember that I said equivalence principle, gravity does the same to everything, so that's every mass, including us. If we start rotating, we send out gravitational waves. Exactly. And so does the Earth mm -hmm. and, and, and the Sun. But that number is very, very small. Okay. And you can calculate how long it would take for the energy leakage to actually make the Earth and the Sun uh, merge into Quite, each other. And yeah. we have l l much bigger problems by that time, because by the time the Sun will have exploded. <laughs> so okay, that's, that's a reassuring... So, uh, yeah. uh, oh, by the way, that's five billion years from now, the explosion of the Sun, okay? Oh. So... Okay, okay. Yes, but, the, but, 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 but the effect is there. They are merging, but it's ridiculously small. Okay, yes. okay. good to know. Are there any questions for Gideon? Yes, here we go. You're from the Space Society. Yes. Oh. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you for a nice uh, presentation. I wonder, when you measure such a gravitational wave, how do you date it? So how would you know uh. it's like before or after the like limit you can see in light? Yeah, no, that's a very, okay, that's a very interesting uh, uh, question. Um, first of all, the dating of the black hole, right? They say, well, this one comes from five billion years ago. Well, it relates to Peter's question because we know how much they shrink along the way. Now, if you do the calculation, I, sh I should take one step back. I'm trying to say too many things at once. If you only get one burst of gravitational waves, right, just one little snippet of gravitational waves, then you cannot really date it because you just get one and you don't know. Right, you measure five, but you don't know whether it started with 100 or 200. So that means you cannot tell how how long it has been traveling. But since the gravitational wave of two merging black holes has this very specific uh, pattern. By the pattern and then its shrinkage, that gives you two pieces of information. One of them tells you that there were black holes of these and these masses, and the other information tells you about the shrinking. So that, that, that dates it. Yeah, okay. There was another question. Go ahead. Well, my question was almost the same. I was wondering, yes. how do you measure uh, direction? Because ah. you're, you're yes. measuring in one direction, uh, uh, only in a linear way. Yeah, no, that's, no, that's a very good question. <laughs> So was yours, by the way. I mean, these are very valid questions. Um, the gravitational wave that comes in right now with the current detectors, Virgo, LIGO, and the Japanese one, Kagra, um, you only measure about half a second of it. Right? Because, again, it's a smallness that makes you only measure half a second. Um, and that makes it very difficult to locate. Um, you can just tell that the gravitational wave came by. Now, if you want to know where it came from, you have to measure it by at least two gravitational wave detectors, because if they measure it in the United States, and you measure the same gravitational wave in Europe, but you measure it slightly in the United States before the other one, then you know it came from that direction. It's very much the way that your eyes work, right? I mean, I can tell, or my ears, I can tell where the sound comes from because it reaches one ear a little sooner than the other. But I don't have to do the math, my, my brain does it for me, but that's how it's done. Here's the nice thing about the Einstein telescope, though. The Einstein telescope, because of its increased sensitivity, doesn't measure gravitational wave half a second. It measures it for a few hours. And here's the nice thing. As the gravitational wave for these few hours is coming by, the Earth is rotating in the same time. And that means, all of a sudden, you're measuring the gravitational wave from different directions. Right? This is, I mean, if I, had, if I had had only one eye, I could still measure depth if I just move around a little bit. And because of the increased sensitivity, a few hours extra gives us rotation of the Earth, makes you look at the same thing from two sides, and then you can pinpoint it on the sky. It's a very good question. Thank you. Cool answer. Very cool. <laughs> Are there any more yes. questions? Yes. I, 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 I let me see. Go ahead. Yeah, I wonder, you, you said also the, the, uh, the time is also shrinking. Um, how can you measure if, if the time is also shrinking, the, then the time the laser pulse uh, lasts is also changed? Yeah, uh, again, very good question. Um, so if I can paraphrase, I mean, if time is also shrinking, um, how, and, and I, I was saying that you take a laser light and it's back and forth, you take that as a measurement that the gravitational wave came by, but if the time is shrinking, how do you know how long it took to make the distance, right? I think this is the heart of your question. Yeah, um, the nice thing about light is that it always goes with the same velocity. I mean, there is a, sh there is a stretching and shrinking of time, yes. Um, but everything that is massless is famously unaffected by it. So things like light and even gravitational waves themselves, they don't feel the shrinking. 
So that's one thing. So that, that, that is one half of the answer. Um, there's a second half to the answer why we're not particularly affected uh, by, uh, by this. Um, and that is that the, the, uh, the light as it is traveling is affected in its color. It's a stretching of space, or, or if time, both of them would, would do the same effect. It's not going to change how fast it is traveling. That is the answer that I just gave a second ago, that all masses thingies go with the same velocity, regardless of what space-time is doing. But it will affect how often the light goes up and down, and that affects the color. So it will only affect the color. It will not affect the distance. Now, there's a final answer, but it's a little bit more technical, and that has to do with, famously, general relativity allows you to uh, decide by somewhere in your mathematics whether you want your effects of relativity to appear in the time part or in the space part. And for the people, this is maybe technical, but for the people who know what I'm talking about, it's called the gauging of general relativity. You can decide whether you want your calculations to affect the stretching of space or the one in time. Now, the calculations that we do, we have made sure in a calculation that the stretching only appears in the spacey part. So even if the light was affected by uh, the stretching of space, we have made a calculation such that we sort of ignore it and still get the right answer. The, the third one is very technical, but, <laughs> but it is true. Thanks, Gideon. <laughs> one more question, then we turn to, uh, to Michiel. Let me see if I can get to you. Uh, can you get the mic? It's for the recording, so it's nice to hear you. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Don't you uh, launch Einstein telescope into the space and measure ah. between satellites? Yeah, again, a very good question. Okay. In fact, it's such a good <laughs> idea that it's, that, it, that it's actually being done. Um, because, you know, as I was saying, the bigger amount of meters you have, the more cumulative stretching you have, the easier it becomes to measure. So there were people who came up with the idea to launch Einstein telescope in space. Uh, and and that, pro uh, that project exists. It's called LISA. It's called the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, in which they shoot up... Uh, three satellites in an orbit around the, the, uh, the sun just lagging behind the Earth, and then all of a sudden you don't have 10 kilometers, they're going for a million kilometers. Uh, that makes it indeed much easier to measure. Um, now, at that point, this might not be... So the answer is, it's such a good idea that's being done right now. <laughs> and the, the moment that it will be delivered, that machine, the LISA, is actually also 2035. So it's about the same time as the Einstein telescope. Now, you might now at this point wonder why would you do both, right? Maybe the spacey one is better. Because first of all, space comes with other complications. A million kilometers with a laser beam, you have to have a powerful laser beam to make that work. That comes with its own technical problems. Mm -hmm. That's one. But secondly, the LISA measures gravitation waves of a much lower frequency than the Einstein telescope. So they both measure gravitation waves, but in a different domain, so they complement each other. So the idea is so good that we're actually going to do this. Well, not me. This oh. is mostly Nijmegen here in the <laughs> Netherlands that does this. But, <laughs> but it's there. The, pro the plan is there. Yeah. Good question. Thank you for your thank questions. You. Gideon, thank you for your great explanation. A big hand for Gideon, please. Thank you very much. And now we turn to Michiel. Are you switched on? Let me see. Okay, good, good. Yep. Okay. Thanks. So very nice to be here and have this opportunity to talk a bit about ongoing uh, research uh, we're doing here at the University of Twente, especially for the Einstein, techno um, Einstein telescope and the Pathfinder succeeding it. Uh, I would like to point out there are two, I can see two of my colleagues working on, so there's Ivan, and uh, Vincent in the audience, uh, I hope I didn't miss anyone else, but they contribute also to, to the results and the things I yeah, will, will present to you. So some of the, um, yes, good. So some of the slides might seem a bit familiar, but I want, I hope I can touch upon different aspects of it. So Einstein telescope, Gideon already said a lot about it. Um, so the few, a uh, novel thing about it uh, is, well, longer arms, a triangular setup, which also helps to the question of wh where does the, the event come from. It helps to have three uh, of these arms instead of only two, because every arm is, is a combination. So you have an interferometer, for instance, this one with this one, and there's a second one going like this, and the third one going like this. 
So by having these three arms and these three different interferometers, uh, you can pinpoint with single device also the, uh, the direction. So that's a, that's a great advantage. Well, it was pointed out to have uh, something which is subterranean. And then um, in the Pathfinder, which is uh, being constructed in Maastricht, we are actually working on uh, these different technologies to help measure more accurately. So uh, work is being done on the mirror coater, so, um, not for mechanical supports, because these supports, uh, there's a kind of suspended pendulums on which the, the mirrors of the optics are suspended. And by improving those, you eliminate noise from the surroundings entering your measurement, basically. So the better you can do this, uh, the more accurate. And the thing I'm going to focus on in, in my talk is the work being done on the cryogenic temperature of the mirrors. We should stand here a bit. Yeah, so this, this picture was already shown. This is the, the lab in Maastricht. And this is kind of a schematic and it helps me to talk you through it. So in Maastricht there's actually uh, uh, an interferometer with only two arms. So there's the beam splitter uh, which splits the laser in two, it's this tower, and then one goes in this direction, the other one goes in this direction. And for the uh, during the talk, sometimes you can see those those details, descriptions. Those are if you know it, it's nice. If you don't, just ignore it, and we can continue. I try to 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 have everyone its own. Um, yeah, this, it it helps if if you do for the understanding and the details. And this this cavity. It is a, it's a thing which is being developed in the optical path. Oh, I switched this around, sorry. Just, just to highlight the enormous scale of collaborations, um, these are all the in, in universities and the institutes which are uh, contributing to the, to the development. And you can see there's so many of them. It's a big collaboration. Uh, Gideon had a small uh, map with all the dots on there. Um, here I listed them. And this cryogenic part is mainly developed by, uh, in collaboration with Maastricht, uh, the High Energy Physics uh, Institute of Spain, and the, that one of uh, the Netherlands. And um, uh, this week we have actually a big a meeting in Maastricht with all these partners to, to plan and develop and align all the technologies and share the results uh, of the development. So it's a really active business going on right now and uh, it's very exciting to be a part of it uh, which uh, Gideon probably can uh, agree on. So these are the optics which are being developed. So here you have two cavities which help to to uh, clean up the signal of the of the laser to improve the resolution. Um, these, these are these things and then the signal it goes here and once a wave goes through you see in some the, the the distance, why is this always? The distance is um, actually changing, and therefore you can measure. And um, that's the basis of, of, of this setup. So it's not actually measuring gravitational waves, it's a platform to develop the technologies needed for the Einstein telescope. So there are two arms. One is the 120K arm, we call it, it's minus 135 Celsius. And uh, what is nice here is that the, the mirrors, which are made of very pure silicon, have a thermal expansion, which is zero. That means that if there is any disturbance in the surrounding temperature, and therefore of the mirror, you won't feel it. And uh, that's basically this point here. This is the curve of silicon expan thermal expansion, and we are exactly here. So if the surroundings change a bit, you will hardly notice it in the in the size, the actual size of the mirror, and therefore you don't uh, doesn't come back in the measurement. And the second arm is the it's a bit of a delay. Yeah, it's a 10k arm, so this goes even to a lower temperature. And what is nice at this temperature is that there are hardly any thermal vibrations in the silicon, and also in the coating for the optics. So at this, these two test arms basically is going to be used to develop and study the quality of the new technology and also study the material properties uh, at these different uh, temperatures. And that's of course very relevant if you want to buy, uh, buy a, if you want to develop a very sensitive measurement device. 
So the 120K arm, you can kind of easily cool by liquid nitrogen, which is 77 Kelvin. And then we use uh, some mirrors. Uh, the mirrors are cooled by a radiation shield. Um, I'll focus on the 10K arm, which is uh, a very uh, which, which we are focusing also here in Twente. So here, this mirror, which is here suspended, here you see the, the uh, insulation, the mechanical insulation here, um, to separate the, the vibrations from the surroundings to the mirror. And this is the mirror. We want to cool this down to 10 Kelvin. Uh, first of all, a bit of crash course on heat transfer. So how can you transfer heat? For the, uh, you can do it by conduction, so if you have a hot object, the heat will uh, flow towards the colder side uh, through the materials itself. You can uh, also have convection, so a hot air, for instance, is passing through your fingers. And the third one is by radiation, so you have thermal radiation just uh, going from the source towards your hands, for instance. And of course, when, when you're cooling, the, the heat flow goes from the hot surroundings towards the cold object. So we want to prevent, of course, this heat flowing in from the surroundings. I don't like it. So what you can do is to minimize the contact with the warm ambient. Uh, you can remove uh, the air, so you won't have any convection. And you can, you can put radiation shields around uh, your cold object, in this case the mirror and uh, to prevent the uh, radiation heat loads. So for the, for the mirror, what you do is you put it in one of these towers. Perhaps you noticed them all before. So you have a very big tower surrounding uh, the mirrors, which are here. And you just uh, remove all the air there. And secondly, you put all these shields around it to prevent any radiation. So by removing the air, you don't have convection. By putting the shields, you don't have radiation. And uh, thirdly, you want to minimize the actual uh, physical connections like rods or, or struts or wires from outside to, to the cold object. There are basically two, two challenges in receiving the 10 Kelvin mirrors. So first of all, you want to cool it down very rapidly. Um, so you need a very high cooling power in a re to do this in a reasonable time. However, all solutions uh, available, they have vibration. They're just mechanical coolers, just like your fridge in your home. You can hear it make noise when it turns on. Same holds for cryogenic coolers. They're different uh, mechanism, but yeah, they have vibrations. So we can only use these before the operation of the actual measurements. But then comes the second challenge. Once your mirror is 10 Kelvin, how do you keep it at this temperature? So you want to uh, measure still at this, uh, this low temperature. But then, this cooler needs to be vibration-free. So the concepts I will discuss are both uh, how we do this and how we do this. So first, the cool-down process. So this is a schematic. So this is just a, a schematic of the mirror tower. And this is some cold interface to which you connect the mirror. And what we will use is to have some kind of helium loop here and uh, to, to cool down the, um, these shields and the cold finger. And uh, um, that means that all these different temperature stages in between, they will have their own heat exchangers, which are, are these. And we circulate some cold helium gas. So gas is, is pushed around by this pump, go through uh, this uh, mechanical cooler, which cools down the gas, it goes into the cryostat into, uh, towards the cold finger, cools down, and then return, returns. And this can be done in a very uh, fast, relatively speaking, way, but it's uh, very vibration heavy. Um, but we want to quantify uh, this. So what do we need to actually have a reasonable cool down? And this is where Ivan uh, did some simulations on. This is, uh, are the results. So what you see here are different uh, probes, different uh, locations in the cryostat. And what's important is this black line. That's the cooldown of the mirror. And this is everything uh, regarding the heat exchangers. So what you see is that all the 
shields, they cool down very fast that within one day. But the mirrors itself take almost two weeks. And that's way too much. Because if we want to change or we, if we want to figure out something is not working properly, it will take so long. And then we need to heat up again. So we're, we basically waste one month. So this is really unacceptable. So what we try to do is to have a better look of what's going on. What is delaying this? And it turns out that this cold finger, which is cooled down within one day, uh, is connected by this uh, thin, ultra-pure aluminum jellyfish wires, which looks like this. So there are some very small wires of only 150 micrometer. There are many of them in these strands connected to this single connection. And what is nice is that this is relatively very flexible. So you can, can connect it, this to the outside and this to the mirror, which is schematically like this. And then any low vibration which might be here are not transferred through these wires to the mirror. However, this aluminium is also very pure, so it will conduct heat very rapidly. For, for, for your comparison, because not every, everyone is familiar with these values, I put here some materials. So this is aluminium at room temperature. This is copper, and this is diamond, which is known to be almost the fastest conducting material at room temperature. I see that even at these low temperatures, this exceeds by a factor of 10. However, it's only during operation conditions that these wires work nicely. So basically what we created is that by decoupling the, the mechanical connection from the outside towards the mirror, we introduce a very large thermal resistance, which causes a delay in time. I will skip this a bit. Um, so this delay in time is then uh, what gives rise to this, this long cooldown time. The, how we did this is to modify the coating. So we can change this epsilon, which is the, how reflective a material is, from a very low value to almost one by having some very nice black paint. And what's nice about black paint, if you have a black car, for instance, it, during the so hot summer day, it will heat up very rapidly. And you're glad that we have uh, invented air conditioning for the cars. But we, do, we will do the same basically for the mirrors. So by coating them black, we have a very nice thermal connection between the, the shielding, which are 15K within one day, and the mirror itself. And if you do this, uh, this trick, what you will find uh, is that the cooldown goes very fast. So, well, relatively speaking, fast. <laughs> so it's only three days now. And then once you reach this, this low temperature, the jellyfin wires, they will take over the conduction. And um, yeah, you, you've, you've reduced this time. And this is acceptable for a normal operation. So the second part is, OK, now we've cooled down this mirror. We can measure very nicely. But then we have this noisy uh, recirculating uh, mechanical cooler, which we wanted to shut down. So how do we ma maintain this low temperature? And this is a uh, focus of uh, the second, uh, th this is the second part of the things we develop here at Twente, is uh, vibration-free cooling. So this is done by a Jules Thompson expansion, which is, um, if you look here, this is a thermodynamic cycle. These are the, basically the components, and this is for the experts' uh, enthalpy pressure diagram which the enthalpy uh, is the available thermal energy, kind of. Um, so what you will do is you compress some, some fluid to a high pressure, and then you use some cooling. So at the compressor side, you remove the heat from the cycle, and then this high pressure is expanded, similar as in your fridge, where you compress the, the gas, liquefy it, and then you use the expansion. Uh, to cool down your, your, your stuff in your fridge. It's the same, same physical pr uh, principle. And then this low pressure gas is then returns, so from the compressor to the high pressure. It expands here, and then it returns through this gas line back to the compressor. And then this, uh, this expansion can be used to cool down and absorb any heat leaks which happen at this 10K, which otherwise would improve, increase the temperature of the, of the mirror. 
this cold gas then returns here and heat is exchanged uh, in a counter flow heat exchanger to close the cycle basically. So take home message, we compress here, expand and the expansion of the gas makes that we can cool the mirror. Keep it at low, low temperature, I mean. Um, in fact, we used three of these stages. It looks a bit complicated. So this was the one I showed before. And then there is a second and even a third stage with multiple counter flow heat exchangers. Um, to increase the efficiency, we also have some pre-coolers here and there. It's a very complicated system. And Vincent worked on modeling this and uh, it's still going on to, to, to optimize this uh, to reach the, the efficiency we need. And I need to check a bit the time, I think. Okay, good. <laughs> so the gases or the fluids we use are neon, hydrogen and helium. So these are then um, connected here to the stages. But a mechanical cooler, as I said before, it causes vibrations. So the solution to do this is to use a sorption compressor. So the sorption compressor is based on kind of a sponge, but then for gas. So where you have a normal bathing sponge, you squeeze it, put it in water, let it expand, and suddenly you have some water in your hand. Well, it drips out, but you get the idea. Similarly, we have here some active coal, which is at low temperature absorbing the gas molecules. And this, this gas is entering here through the return line, uh, some buffering. Um, it goes into the cell, and then we heat the cell. So this wiring is just some, some resistive uh, material. Some heat is released, and then the temperature increases. And by increasing the temperature of this coal, all the gas molecules go into gas phase again. But here are some check falls. So this gas cannot flow back into the low pressure, because this is blocking. It will go back here. So by this cycle, we can have without any mechanical parts, but only these small check falls, we can increase the pressure from low to a high, uh, high state and close the thermodynamic cycle. And this is typically done in time. So you have a, a, um, an increase in temperature in the cell, then you shut off the, the heating, the liquid nitrogen bath surrounding will cool down this thing again to a low temperature. And in pressure, you see that there's an increase of all the gas desorbing. And then when uh, it cools down, it resorbs again. And if you put some of these cells in uh, together, have some buffer, you can nicely have this uh, a continuous stream of low pressure going in and high pressure going out. So these two techniques, the sorption compressor and the jules thomson expansion, enable us to have vibration-free cooling. Uh, although low in capacity, it, uh, it does not disturb any measurements during operation. So, um, how does it look like in the facility? Well, we add two towers, which are the sorption compressors, connect them to these lines, and inside here you see the, the bottom part of one of these mirror towers. Um, you see here two mirrors. Uh, here are the mechanical supports to isolate the, the vibration from the surroundings. And here in underneath, and I think I have a zoom, here you see all these heat exchangers, which were just small schematics, which you see, in fact, is a very tight space. And for instance, this lowest, this 8 Kelvin interface with the helium can reach up to 30 meter of tubing to reach the efficiency which we need to be able to maintain this low temperature during operation. Here you see some, some of the shields. So this is the liquid nitrogen radiation shield, the 40 Kelvin and the 15 ones. And these are, these are all necessary to remain these low temperatures. So with that, um, yeah, I've, uh, we talked about the Einstein telescope. Um, and the cryogenic temperature will benefit accuracy by reducing any thermal noises. And therefore, we will test the technologies in the Einstein telescope pathfinder for mirrors at 120 and at 10 Kelvin. Um, this is the team where, which we have here in Twente for those uh, 10 Kelvin sorption coolers. So we do this collaboration with Demcon Krios uh, based in Enschede 
and the, the company Cool, which is in Hengelo, and here we are at the UT. And unfortunately, Ivan has left us. He's continuing studying, so he, he will. But of course, he will still be very uh, enthusiastic about any developments we will share with him. Um, this area. Yeah. So with that, my oh, it goes out. So there's now room for some questions, which I am happy to to answer. Okay. And thank I you. Hope that I gave you a nice flavor. <laughs> Michiel, thank you very much for your very cool presentation, if I may <laughs> call it that way. Um, let, let me start with a very, um, I think it's a very silly question. Um, you have this whole mirror stuff cooled down, but doesn't this laser heat up the mirrors? Or, or isn't that a problem? How, how uh, does it work? A good question. Uh, so working with lasers can be very deceiving because typically the laser power is actually the amount of money you pay from the plug. So it could be that the one kilowatt <laughs> is actually resulting in, I think, one watt of actual oh, continuous okay. laser. Okay. But, but you're right that, that any radiation will have impact on, and that's yes. one of the, the heat loads. So I, have, yes, I think... I uh, think it's picture, what you see here, down below, we uh, calculate for 50 milliwatt of, of uh, mm -hmm. heat load on the mirror itself. Aha, uh -huh. okay. And that, that, that's, only, only, that's for one pair of the mirrors, mm -hmm. there are two connected to a single cooler. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of radiation uh, okay. uh, absorption, which, which you can expect. And yeah. of course, everything you expect, you cannot get out as a signal, signal as well. No. So that's why the coatings are very important to develop, to have such, such a high uh, reflectivity. Yes, yeah. I think and we, we can benefit from it. Yeah, we can have a special evening about just building these mirrors. Yeah. The laser beam is also very monochromatic, very mm -hmm. special. So, so yeah. The, yeah, okay, but we will turn to the cooling part <laughs> this evening. Go ahead. Thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, these sobsy coolers still create pressure fluctuations. Don't they induce mechanical vibrations by this? Or is it separated in frequency? Um, well, it's not... It's. Um, well, the, there are, of course, the buffer vessels, which are, are already suppressing uh, yep. many of those things. And um, yes, in, in theory, you have the... If in the Indeed, the, the pressure fluctuations will induce vibrations. Also, the the check valves, the opening and the closing of those. But um, as in the schematic, the sorption tower is outside the mirror tower. There are very stiff connections of the lines going from one tower to another, and then many more stiff components, which which will help to to reduce those as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Yes, let's go over here. Go ahead. So my, my question is a bit naive maybe too, but you, you put a black coating on a mirror. So I would argue it's not a mirror anymore. Yeah, very valid uh, <laughs> comment. <laughs> of course, we don't coat the reflective parts. So it's, it's the backside and the, um, and, and the, the circular. So, so that means you win half only? Yeah, kind of. A and what does the black then do for the heating up? In the, in the measurement stage, because that should be yeah. faster then. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a trade-off mm. we need to account for. But uh, during the operation, you saw that these, um, these, these flexible wires, which I said, they have this very high connectivity peak. So although you in, um, absorb more heat from the 15 Kelvin shields, the conduction through these small wires down to the, to the cooler will be adequate enough to, to keep up. But indeed, you see that these five 50 milliwatts will go up slightly. Yeah. But yeah. of course, we have some margin. But we calculate for 30, and then it will be 35. Or yeah, but, but black is then really the best. So th I was thinking, do you optimize the, uh, the reflectivity of the absorption of the, of the coating? Or is it just bla black is best? That was a bit... Um yeah, black is best. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Are there any more questions for 
Michiel. Of course, you can ask questions for uh, uh, Guillaume as well. That's He's still in the room. Also yeah. a less technical question, uh, but what sizes are we talking about? So for example, how big is a ah. mirror? Um, so the mirrors the of the Pathfinder, I think, are 20 centimeters. But in I the have a measuring rod. Oh yeah, excellent. If, if you do that, it comes then in I, handy. 20 I get the, centimeters. the schematic again. That's not too big, is it? But the Einstein, how big will they be? Half a meter. Half a meter, okay, yeah. that's better. So. Here you see people standing around to give you an impression. So there are some um, these these bluish clean room guys standing here, and this tower is six meters. Uh -huh. And these are the the tubes in which the the beams go back and forth. So mm -hmm. to give you a bit of a skill, this, this is twenty meters. Roughly. Yeah. And if this is going to be built in Maastricht, it's two hundred fifty meters below the ground. ground. Yeah. Um, so you have, how is it going to be built? It, is it, it's like building a mine first, or how? Yeah, how? I, I, yeah, like that. I yeah. think they will just have some some tunnel digging yeah. machines they, yeah. they use in Switzerland and uh, go for it, I guess. Yes. Yeah. But it's a, a large part of the budget is in fact going into having this facility there, and also to have the the cryogenic tubing inside it, yes. and with it all its you need to install it in a clean way yes. to prevent any contamination there. Of course. Uh, yeah. Because it can get on the mirrors. So you want to have it clean. Mm -hmm. And that for, well, uh, 30 kilometers in total. It, wow. It's a huge amount. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Yes, it really is. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. Earthquakes. Can you project earthquakes? I see Gion nodding. Yeah, but Michiel predict or measure? Yeah, predict or measure. Predi predict. Gideon, can you predict? Um, yes. Yes? Um, okay, cool. That's well, nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice prediction. No, no, no. We, we have geologists uh, who, of course, know more about this uh, than I do, but the, yeah. the, the thing before things become an earthquake, they start with small rumbles, and, and, and those can be measured literally on the other side of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, how well you can. So I think the detection can be made in an early stage of an earthquake, but whether it will be recognized as an earthquake, I think a geologist might be better yeah. suited mm -hmm. to answer. But, but, but uh, measurement-wise, in uh, accuracy-wise, uh, the machine will be able to do that, yes. Yes, of course, but it will be a disaster for the machine, I think. Yeah, so, so currently they're um, actually doing field measurements, currently um, on the border uh, in, in Belgium, Netherlands, mm -hmm. to actually probe the quality of the soil and the ground underneath. So you have this 250 meters. I think one half of it is just nice soil to absorb vibration from trains, windmills, cars, pedestrians. Mm -hmm. And beneath that, you want to have nice, firm uh, rock kind of uh, stuff to, mm -hmm. to not move. So in that, that okay. sense, uh, Italy is an interesting location, I would say. Yes. Because yeah. of the tectonics, yeah. Yes, of course. And um, the alternative is Sardinia, isn't it? The it's, yeah, that's yeah. Italy. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Okay, that's still to be decided. Yeah, but that, that's uh, politics. So yeah. Let's see how how uh, yeah, we don't how do these different things are weighted. We it's not not to, yeah, up to we us. don't do politics tonight. No, no, no. I know. I don't want to touch on just it. Just science <laughs> and gravitational <laughs> waves. Yeah. Um, okay. I know. More questions. I had one myself. Um, there's a question which you hear a lot about sustainability. Um, how much energy does this machine? need to, to operate, because you need 30 kilometers of vacuum tubes. I think that costs quite uh, a little bit of energy to make those tubes vacuum. You have the laser, you have the cooling device. Is there any estimate how much energy this machine consumes? And yeah, I should th check th the report. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. So, uh, in in the um, it, it's a very relevant uh, part of, of of the of the uh, how do you say the, the bit of, of the solution to the European Union, in which mm -hmm. many of these aspects are also addressed. So it's not only the technology; it's also about offering the uh, the jobs, the development of, of education mm -hmm. coming out, and indeed also uh, how do we do it in a sustainable way? Yes, it's, it's all yeah. part of the of the big file which goes to the EU. 
yes. uh, to, yeah. to be judged. And that's, that's uh, I think, also part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. To round off with a more speculative question for Gideon. Um, maybe it's also a silly question, but never mind. Uh, uh, what do you expect to see beyond the, the, f the, the light border, so to say? <laughs> so what, what might the Big Bang, the Dark Ages, yeah. lo look like? Could you say anything about this, or is it just... Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah go ahead. It is, of course, speculative. The, um, mm -hmm. the nice thing is that we understand general relativity uh, very well. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that everything that we think that happened in a couple of hundred thousand years on the left hand side of the, uh, the, the light barrier, so to say, mm -hmm. um, we have absolutely no reason to believe that, that general relativity and our predictions there are going to be very, very different. Um, it becomes much more speculative at the moment that you get to a, a few minutes to a few seconds after Big Bang. Um, first of all, because uh, the, the matter that was at that moment there, I mean, the, the, the first matter came around about around three minutes after Big Bang, mm -hmm. but it was under such extreme conditions that our laws of quantum mechanics that we now uh, use to predict at CERN, for instance, how matter works, mm -hmm. that's at energy scales uh, much bigger than. So even though we know what type of stuff is floating around, we've never tested it before at that scale. That's so mm -hmm. much, much higher. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we don't know. There are people in the Netherlands and in the world, uh, famously the experiment called ALICE, where they try to, uh, it, at CERN, bounce particles up into each other to mimic that very early conditions. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no full theory of that yet. So mm -hmm. the short answer is, uh, we don't know. At the moment that you get close enough that the matter becomes at that high stages, mm -hmm. then things become much more speculative. But at the moment that it has cooled down enough that it looks like the matter that we know and have studied all along, mm -hmm. then normal general relativity takes over. And I would be very surprised if we see something extremely new there. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's the first time they're going to look at a place with a machine that was never been turned on before. And history tells us that mm -hmm. every time you turn on a machine that has never looked before, you're going to see something that nobody expected. Mm -hmm. Wow. So we don't know. Exciting, exciting. Thank you so much, um, uh, Michiel and uh, Gideon. Um, this is a really wonderful evening. Um, I think uh, it's very impressive also that Einstein predicted all this some more than 100, year, 100 years ago. And basically, we're still doing his homework. So that's, that's a good reason to call this uh, machine the Einstein uh, telescope. But uh, fascinating science and engineering. I was really, really impressed. Thank you very much. Michiel and Gideon. Big hand. Thank you. Mooi. Mooi. Thank you all.